Hello, my name is Jessica Redkoski, and I'm going to be talking about my experience adopting a genomic enabled breeding strategy. Although we've made significant progress in agricultural productivity, there are challenges that still remain. In the state of Illinois, average net income per farm in recent years has been cut in half. And at the same time, there are many environmental concerns with our farming practices. For example, in the state of Illinois, uh, we're one of the biggest contributors to nutrient runoff into the Gulf of Mexico. And so we have to think of solutions that not only improve uh, total productivity, but they can also address some of these other challenges. And small grains, especially winter wheat, can really help address some of these challenges because it can provide some profit stability, at the same time act as a cover crop and help reduce nutrient runoff. In the state of Illinois, wheat is uh, more of a minor crop. It uh, covers about 500,000 acres. Most of those acres are in the southern part of the state where wheat is grown in a double cropping system with soybean. So the wheat is planted in the fall, harvested in June, July, and then the soybean is planted immediately after that. What's really encouraging is that in recent years in Southern Illinois, the profitability of wheat soybean double cropping has actually been greater than the profitability of corn, soybean, or wheat alone. And I believe that if we focus on improving the profitability of this system in our region, wheat can become more prevalent and help us to diversify agricultural landscape while also benefiting growers' income. Now, improving this profitability of wheat production support a more diverse agricultural landscape is actually one of the major aims of my research as part of the Illinois Small Grains Program. We are actually a combination of two research labs working on small grains. Most of our research is conducted in the fields and we have one large scale field program. We have a very vibrant and high performing team. The PIs include me and Dr. Juan Arbelais. We have graduate students, uh, research specialists, undergraduate interns, a postdoc, and the team continues to grow. So if you're interested, just contact me. We all work together. We're all really passionate about plant breeding as well as thinking about how to do things in a different way. Now, when I got to University of Illinois, uh, right about a year into my time here, I decided that I would take the reading strategy and really redesign it, starting from a blank sheet of paper and make it so that it's really optimized to maximize genetic gain using all the tools that we have available, especially genomic selection. So how this strategy ended up looking was doing rapid generation advancement in the greenhouse to really get to a fixed line as soon as possible, genotyping those candidates, uh, doing genomic selection to select parents and to make advancement decisions. And then in the testing program, uh, I really redesigned it so that the data and the, and the designs are meant uh, to help train a prediction model. So instead of having different breeding stages separate, separately randomized, I put all the material in one sparse, fully randomized testing program to minimize the amount of confounding between genetic and non-genetic factors. And that's really because when we're training genomic selection models, we're putting all the data together. We're not taking separate pieces and analyzing them separately, but we really wanna take everything and put it all together to estimate breeding values. The other big change that I implemented was to really well define the breeding objective and to make it uh, very consistent and really targeted towards profitability. To do that, I use a profit function to select lines and crossing parents. And I take the major traits that affect profitability and just combine them uh, in such a way that I have an estimate of the profit potential of every line. The main traits that drive profitability are the yield, early maturity, vomitoxin, which is caused by the Fusarium head blight pathogen, and test weight. Vomitoxin and test weight affect the 
uh, price of the wheat. So because if there's a high vomitoxin or low test weight, the um, farmer will get discounted when he tries to sell to the, to the elevator. Early maturity is also important because the earlier that the wheat can be harvested, the sooner soybean can be planted and the higher soybean yield can be obtained. So I have a profit function that takes all this and allows me to uh, select kind of an optimal way to achieve uh, prof higher profitability. And it all starts with crossing. I use this net merit function and uh, breeding values to actually determine what crosses to make, what are the best combinations. I can predict the uh, progeny value of every of each trait for every possible combination. And then when I go into the greenhouse, um, I have an algorithm that I uh, put into a Shiny app that will tell me of the males and females that, that are available that day for crossing, what, is the best, what are the best crosses that can be made that day? And uh, so the idea is that every day that I can make crosses, I'm making the best possible crosses um, based on progeny, value, and net merit. The other big activity is, of course, yield evaluation. We have currently four locations in the state of Illinois with 6,000 plus yield plots. Um, I'm growing this and um, through collaborations, getting more locations. And then for out of state locations, we have four that are a very small number of lines for evaluation for variety release. And as I was mentioning, I redesigned the testing strategy in such a way that it's completely randomized and I use partially replicated design. So stage one through four um, lines that are in yield trials, they're randomized together. And I use partially replicated design so that only lines at later stages of testing are being replicated. That's convenient in two ways. One, in the later stages of testing, we have more seed so we can actually replicate. And we also want to get higher quality data and more information on those material so that we can make very good variety release decisions. One important, uh, one Im important feature of this strategy is that I have one randomization per field so that the trial effect is the field effect and there are no additional non-genetic effects that could be confounding. Here's an example of what that looks like. So here's one field uh, that I had in Urbana this year where I had a partially replicated design. So the whole field, there was just only one field design and my early stage lines are here shown in green. They were unreplicated. The later stage lines were replicated. These are the ones in white and um, I have blocking to control uh, the error variance. In addition to just yield, of course, scab resistance is a major factor in profitability because um, scab or FHB causes um, vomitoxin to accumulate in the grain, which affects the price that the farmer will get for the grain at the elevator. For scab resistance screening, it's a really big undertaking. We have 5,000 small plots per year. It's inoculated with green spawn inoculated and misted. And evaluating scab resistance is a very tedious, time-consuming, resource-intensive task. There are multiple phenotypes, uh, so the disease expresses in different ways in terms of uh, severity of, of symptoms, incidence, how, how many spikes are infected, uh, how many kernels are infected, how severely are those kernels infected, and also the vomitoxin or the DON, um, as, as it's otherwise called. This is a quantitative trait. There are many, many QTL that have been discovered. They interact with environment. And so this improving this trait is, um, requires a lot of long-term commitment and resources. Multi-trait genomic selection uh, is a really good option for selecting for Don resistance to fusarium, especially for uh, low Don or low vomitoxin. And how this works is that 
you have a training set where you have uh, information on all the traits. So you can have information on the Don, vomitoxin, uh, fusarium damaged kernels, incidents on, you know, and severity. So those are the spike um, traits, the, the traits that we measure visually on spikes before harvest, and we have the marker data. And then on our new breeding candidates, we have uh, all those visual phenotypes again. We have we, data on fusarium damaged kernels, but what we don't have on our new candidates is the information on the levels of DON because DON takes a lot of time to get um, the data back. We have to send it off to a lab. The lab has to run the analysis. And so typically at the time of selection, we just don't have DON data. So what we ultimately wanna do is use a multi-trait prediction model to uh, get a good estimate of resistance to DON using all the available information that we have. We tested this out with a couple of data sets to um, confirm that it's a, it's a good strategy and also to determine which secondary traits would be most useful to help predict DON. Uh, here we have uh, results from two different data sets. The box plots on the top of the slide uh, correspond to a data set from the University of Illinois. Then towards the bottom of the slide, there's a, uh, results from a data set from Purdue. You can see, uh, we see pretty much similar patterns. So the all the way to the left is the accuracy of prediction using a univariate model where all we have is Dawn. And then the bars on the right, we're using secondary trait information that is available on our candidates of selection as well as on the training set. And what we see actually is that whenever we have FDK, we have a very uh, good prediction accuracy from multi-trait genomic selection. And if we uh, eliminate FDK from the model, then the accuracy goes down and it's not that much better than univariate. Uh, another interesting observation was that once we have FDK in the model, using the additional traits, incidence, and severity doesn't really improve accuracy. So this might suggest that we don't really need to be phenotyping all the fusarium resistance traits, which could really help reduce the amount of resources and, and, and time that we spend with this trait. So this is just, I think, an example where in the context of genomic selection, some of our practices and you know, even our phenotyping strategies could actually be impacted and it could actually help us to save resources if we really rethink and reconsider everything that we're doing. Now, given that FDK is such an important trait and it, it really you know, shows to be very helpful in predicting uh, Dawn, we've really focused on how to make that phenotyping more effective. And so one thing that we're uh, trying out is doing some uh, machine learning, especially uh, um, deep learning based on images of grain to, to do FDK phenotyping. And the ultimate goal would be to uh, be able to take a picture of grain and uh, you know, with your phone and then have an app that will actually score FDK right on the spot so that anybody with very minimal training could very quickly take FDK data on thousands of grain samples. And so that we can get the data uh, faster, be able to spend more time analyzing it and make better selection decisions going into the fall. Just to summarize, we have a vibrant and innovative small grains breeding and research program at the University of Illinois. We're rethinking every aspect of the breeding strategy in the context of genomic selection. And you know, excellent progress is being made and we're really building on excellent uh, work that has been done in the past and just trying to uh, continually improve the breeding process. We just need to acknowledge a lot of uh, people in the lab uh, as well as our funding sources. And I hope there are time for questions. Thank you.